So welcome to my session about what the crack. Coordinated restore at checkpoint on the Java virtual machine. It's actually not really crack what you think is uh, crack, right? Because the original title was Java on crack and we changed that a little bit because in some countries it's not that, that good to use that title. So <laughs> that's the reason if you don't find this title in the agenda, then the reason is because we changed it. So about me, my name is Gerrit Grunwald. I'm working for Azul Systems as a developer advocate. I did a lot of front-end in the past 10 years and I'm now happy to be able to work also on the back-end side and on JVM side. So Java is great, right? We can all agree on that, I guess. And we have a vibrant community, as we can see with this event, which is just awesome, awesome venue, by the way. And uh, we have hundreds of Java user groups and we have thousands of free open source software projects which is just great. But the really, the star of the whole ecosystem, and now my clicker just fails, okay, is uh, the Java virtual machine. This is the thing that makes everything possible. But the question is, how does it work? How does the JVM work? And I, I mean not really everything within the JVM, but we will take a look at some parts of it that are interesting for this session. So if you have your Java code, your Java class in a Java file, you put that in the Java C compiler, it creates some bytecode out of it, which is cross-platform usable, and then we take the bytecode and we use a class loader to load that bytecode into JVM memory. This is a very simplified view, but you get the idea. From the JVM memory, which is much more than this, um, it goes into the so-called execution engine. And the execution engine, as you can see, contains a lot of different things, and we just, if you take a look at that, we have the interpreter, we have the C1 compiler, the C2 compiler, we have a profiler, we have a garbage collection. Well, for this session, we just focus on these first three things. So that means the interpreter, the C1, and the C2 compiler. So how it works is, first of all, the interpreter takes the code and puts it into, it, or interprets it into the instruction set of the CPU that we are running on. And the JVM is watching that, right? So it's looking at it, the profiling, and it's counting method calls. And once this method, method calls reach a specific threshold, it will just take the code and pass it forward to the C1 compiler. So the C1 JIT compiler is uh, it, it's a compiler. It comes from the client side, from the history. And um, what it does is it compiles code very quickly and not really high optimized. So because on the client side, you can imagine if you, for example, start up your IDE, you would like to press start and it should be there. So you can't really spend a lot of time in optimizing the code just to make it the best code available because the user in front of the machine would like to start working, right? So once it's C1 compiled code, again, the JVM is looking at it and profiling and figuring out, oh, this code was called again a lot of times maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000, there are some thresholds. And then again, it takes the code, the hot code, and pass it forward to the C2 compiler. The C C2 compiler, formerly known as the server compiler, is slower, but it creates more optimized code, which runs faster and which is just better if you compare it like this. So this is called so-called tiered compilation. This wasn't always available in the JVM. I think it started in JDK 7, if I'm right. And then with JDK 8, it became the standard. And we have different levels of execution in the JVM in this tiered compilation. And um, you can transfer from one to the other, but the mainly used ones are thus this three. So that means we have interpretation, which is level zero. Then we have C1 with full profiling. And this profiling is used then from the, from the profiler for the C2 compiled code. <coughs> if it's possible, the JVM will use this uh, order of calling it, but there are different transitions possible. So, if we take a look at it, I just name it execution cycle, then we start with interpretation, which is slow, level zero, then we followed by some profiling phase, which is this one, <coughs> to find so-called hotspots, which is, by the way, the reason why the hotspot compiler is named hotspot compiler, because it finds this hot code spots. Then we have C1 compilation, which is fast, but the code is not very optimized. <coughs> it is level two, mainly. And then, or level three, is it in this? No, it's, yeah, it's three. Um, 
And then we have uh, another profiling phase, which is followed by C2 compilation, and then we more or less have the optimized code. But because the comp compilers create not static code, this is, it optimizes the code, it can lead to so-called deoptimization. So that means the compiler creates some code, and then it figures out, oh, wait a minute, I can make this code really fast, but under some specific circumstances. And if this change, the circumstances change, then it might be, a, might be possible to take the code, throw it away, go again to interpretation C1, C2. So the so-called deoptimization, I try to visualize it somehow. So let's say we have the, this method check value, and it has uh, some condition. If the value is larger than zero, then return three, otherwise return zero. Very simple. Right? So if the profiler figures out that the hot path of this method is the first one, then it could do something like this. It can just say, just return three for all the values. I don't care. So you can imagine what happens. You have to guard the whole execution stuff in the way that if the value is larger than three, just return three. Or larger than zero, sorry. Just return three. Otherwise, do the deoptimization. Deoptimization in this case means throw the code away, put it again to interpretation C1, C2, and use the whole method and optimize it, right? <clears throat> this is uh, unfortunate because it leads to some drawbacks. Because you can imagine if you have the code running and suddenly you have deoptimization, means going back to interpretation and all that, the performance will drop. But this, this is all great, but as you can imagine, it just takes some time, right? If we take a look at the JVM performance graph, which is something that we did a while ago, then it looks something like this, where we have the yellow phase, which is the interpretation, then we have the green phase, which is, which is profiling C1, and then we have the blue one, which is C2, and you see it gets faster and faster if we nominate it to one, and then this is usually the time that the JVM needs to start up, or the application, more or less. <coughs> because at some point, it will level out, and uh, then we see something like that. Then you see these gaps in the graph. So this is typically garbage collection pauses. That's the reason why you see them in a very similar distance, uh, time after time. And then here, these gaps, this is the optimizations. That means in, during the startup, it, the JVM does some optimizations, and then it figures out, oh, it fails, has to optimize again, and then we see these performance gaps in the beginning. So this is what it usually looks like. That's all cool, but if you run it in a microservice environment, then it would look like this. First start, warm up. Okay, second start, warm up. Third start, warm up, and so on and so on. This is a little bit disappointing. If you think about Amazon Lambdas, for example, they suffer from that because it's mainly, it's not big code. You have to run it, but you have to warm it up first, right? This is, this is the drawback. Wouldn't it be great if we can do something like that? First time warm up, second time full speed. Third time full speed. In principle, always full speed. That would be great. This is something we would like to achieve, um, but we, uh, we will come to that later. Um, because someone asked me, well, there is class data, sh data sharing. Can we also improve startup time with this? Who, who knows that? Yeah. It's interesting um, because I think it's, it's enabled per default uh, in the meantime. But what it does is it's, it's called class data sharing. There is up, data sh up class data sharing dynamic. It dumps internal class representations in a file. Then they will, this will be shared during the JVM startup. And what it in principle does, it optimizes the class loading time, which is right before all the compilation and interpretation will, will happen. So there's no optimization or hotspot detection here. It's really just make sure the class loading will be fast. This is the main intention. So that means it reduces the loading time of classes, which is fine. You can get up to one to two seconds, but it's not really the stuff we are talking about. <clears throat> and it's enabled per default uh, in the JVM anyway. So it works at that point, if you remember the, the first graph that I showed. So we are over there where the compilers are working. So this is fine, but it's not really the solution. There's another one, which is ahead of time compilation. So who's using Graal here, native image, in production? Okay, at least a, a few. Um, so why not use AOT? So 
first of all, we don't have to interpret bytecode. This is great. There's no analysis of hotspots. Cool, we save time. Runtime compilation of code, not needed. And we can start up at full speed straight away. It's just bam. And GraalVM native image does that, right? So problem solved? Uh, not so fast. Because AOT is by definition static. That means you compile the stuff before the code is run, right? So you just take the code, compile it, done. You can imagine that if this is not the same as running it in a JIT because this, of the tiered compilation, we have all the optimization. You can't do that if you compile it just once. So the compiler has no knowledge of the code that's actually running afterwards. It just takes the code, compiles it, and done. There is something called profile-guided optimization. This is kind of a help, but it not, it's not really the solution to, to keep up with the JVM in this case. So if we take again a look at the uh, JVM performance graph, then it could look like this. You compile the code, AOT compiled, you get up to 60% of the speed, which this really depends on the application. You can't really t tell that in general. And then you can do the PGO, which will another bring you another 20% maybe. You can get up to 86, 90% of the JVM speed level. But this really heavily depends on your application. This, this is not a general rule, but in principle, you can think about it like this. And this uh, profile-guided optimization also needs a dry run to create the profile, and then you can apply it, right? So this is, it's good for specific use cases, but this is not the stuff we are looking for here. <clears throat> so if we compare AOT and JIT, then we can say that AOT can't make use of method inlining. You can't really create runtime, a bytecode generation at runtime is not possible. Reflection, reflection the guys who use uh, RALVM here, the, anybody problems with reflection? You don't have to be shy. I know that there are problems, <laughs> but it's okay. It's fine. I mean, it's, this is not really bashing AOT. There's a use case for that, and there's a use case for the stuff that, that I will tell you, but if you compare, these are just the drawbacks, right? <clears throat> you can't use uh, speculative optimizations in the uh, AOT version here, and the overall performance is typically lower than on the JVM, which is okay. That's fine. And the biggest thing is, if you use a native compiled image, native code is not Java code. This is different, and it behaves differently. So, and things in native code are different than in Java code, and it doesn't mean the code itself, it's how it's done in the compiled code, how it's executed, it's different. So that means the deployed environment is a different one because you deploy a native image than if you use something that runs on the JVM, because this is the same that you can use on your machine to, to debug and all that. It is possible to, to debug the native image stuff, but it's not the same. So you have to just keep that in mind. On the other side, AOT is fast. Starts up like this. JVM needs some warm-up time. And we don't have this uh, CPU overhead that we have at the JVM level when we start up the JVM, because we have to run the application. At the same time, we have to use the CPU to compile, interpret, optimize, all that stuff. OK, that means the JIT disadvantages that we have. We need a warm-up time, and we have a CPU overhead, especially at startup, which is a drawback. And who's suffering from JVM startup time here? A few. OK. That might be something for you. Um, and who heard about crack already? OK, and the same. <laughs> so now, if we take a short look at JIT optimizations, I don't want to go into details, but there's stuff like dead code elimination. We have things like constant folding, inlining, which is interesting. And there's one thing which is called loop unrolling. Who knows what it is? Because that's very fascinating, and you can test it on your own. If you create a little program in Java, and you have a maybe complex method that calculates prime numbers or something, and then you run it a thousand times in a loop, call that method, and you unroll this to 1,000 to 1, calls, you will see that even on your normal machine, you will see an increase by nearly 50% in speed, just by unrolling it in the Java code. That's, it was really, I tried that, and it's really fascinating to see what this has for an effect on, on optimizing code. And there are many more of, of other optimizations that are done in the JIT. Well, let's take a look at a different approach then. So there is a project called Creo. Who knows Creo? 
a few. It's very fascinating. It, it's checkpoint restore in user space, and it's a Linux project. It's in the kernel since 2013, and um, it, it was made to freeze a running application or container, and then checkpoint it into a file, and then at another point restore the stuff again into memory and run it again. That was the main idea. And it's in the meantime used by different tools like OpenVZ, like Docker, Podman, they all use Creo. And um, so it's well tested, I would, I would like to say. Um, but it also comes with some challenges. So for example, you can imagine restart from a saved state on a different machine. You, you might think that's possible, right? You can just take the, the checkpoint, you take the file, put it on another machine and restore it from there. You can imagine that it doesn't really work at the beginning. It's not that easy. The other thing is you could think about starting it multiple times on the same machine. Also, that doesn't work because uh, there are ways around it, but you have the PID, the process ID on Linux, and this is also stored. So that means if you restore it, you can imagine you can't really run the same application with the same PID at the same time. There are ways to do that, but this is just a hack. And then in the end, the Java virtual machine would assume it just was continuing its tasks. So it's, it's not so easy. So you, you think about, oh, the JVM is just an application. Ah, it's not. It's a little bit more than that. So you can't just checkpoint the JVM and then restore it at some point. It, it won't really work. And that leads us to crack. And the most important part is the coordinated restore a checkpoint here. Because if we guide the JVM through that process, then it is possible to checkpoint it and restore it. So that means we bundle Creo with the JDK version, and we can then clean the heap, compact it, and make sure that the JVM is in a safe state. Right? It can throw checkpoint exceptions, so that means if something went wrong, this crack thing will tell you something went wrong. So you won't get lost somewhere. And it comes with a pretty simple API. We will take a look at that too. Well, you can create checkpoints either in code or you can use J command to do that. And you can find the stuff under this link, openjdk.org project slash crack. And that means this is an open JDK project already, right? And this also means this is nothing if you would like to try it, you don't, don't download an Azul thing, and it's not something that bounds you to Azul. We just developed the technology, and we committed it to OpenJDK, and it was accepted. So that means the JDK that you can download there is an OpenJDK build that has the code that we created. <coughs> it's led by Anton Koslov, which was one of our engineers. Okay, so it has a little bit, it's a little bit different from Creo, because I told you already it's the coordinated part. So that means we have to let the JVM and especially the application know when we do a checkpoint and then when we restore it, again, we have to let the application know, okay, you get, you, you get restored right now. So, and the reason for that is you can imagine if you have, for example, <coughs> you have a database manager. This stuff is just a, it's a responsible for establishing a database connection and restoring it or shutting it down or whatever. And if you just have the database connection open and you shut it down, it will probably break. So you have to shut it down correctly. So that means we just will provide methods to do that. That means if you shut it down, we will let the application know, then you can react on that. Just close the database connection and when we restore, again, you can restore the connection. That's the main idea behind it. To do that, you need this specific JDK that you will find under the link that I showed already. And you have this special uh, keys here, like the crack checkpoint two equals path. That means if you start it up like that, then and create a checkpoint, the checkpointed files will be stored under this path. And if you restore it from a checkpoint, then you just point it to the, to the folder where you have stored the files and it will restore it from there. The nice thing about that is you can think about stuff like creating an application, you have an application that is used by different parts of the company. One part uses it in that way, the other part uses a totally different way of the application. So you can create a checkpoint for the one part, store it in some folder, and if they start it up, 
they start up from this checkpoint, and the others can start up from another checkpoint, right? Because the application could be optimized either for that part or for that part. It depends. So this is uh, some of the beauties, because it's, it's pretty simple. And I talked already about the API that we have. That's a Crack API, which is a nice name. Um, it just is one interface, code resource. It comes with two methods, before checkpoint and after restore. And that's all you need. The drawback, and I have to say it's, it's a little drawback here, because what you have to do, you have to implement that interface everywhere where you use resources. Not every resource, but stuff like open files, database connections, or some open sockets. This stuff has to be closed. And it's not a problem if you miss something, because there will be checkpoint exceptions. So that means if you create a checkpoint and you forgot something, it will tell you checkpoint exception in this class, so you know, okay, I forgot to do that. But you have to touch the code. This is, a, this is a little bit of the drawback, and it depends on your code structure, if it makes sense or not. If you have spread all this resource uh, access somewhere over your classes, then good luck. Take some time to fix that. But if you have it somehow structured, then it's not that big of a problem to do that. Okay, that means we have this resource interface, and these resource objects need to be registered somehow in the, in the JDK, right? The JDK has to know which classes have the resource interface. So that means we have to register it in this so-called context. And you can get the global context by the core class. It's core.getGlobalContext. It's, it's just a static call. You can get the context and then register your resources there. So that means, in principle, the, the way to use it is like this. You have your application, you have your class, you implement the resource interface, you get the glo global context and register your interface. That's all what you need to do. And then you can make sure that these classes will be called in your resource class. And we will, I will come to an example which makes it more clear how it works. <coughs> so then there's another thing. You can think about having resources that depending on other resources. That means you have, for example, a database connection that's needed before you open a socket because you load some data from there, whatever. If you now close that, <clears throat> you have to make sure to close it in the right order. And if you restore it, you have to make sure it's in the reverse order, right? To make sure that everything is in the same state as it was when it was shut down. And this is uh, the, the global context will take care about that. So that means the before checkpoint methods will call the, the resources in the order you register them. And if you do after restore, then they will be called in the reverse order to make sure that everything is in the same state as before the checkpoint. And then you can do also the, the checkpointing by calling a method, which is core checkpoint restore. So the question is, why should we do that by code, <coughs> right? If you have a JVM-based application, so who is using code to warm up the JVM? Someone? Nobody? Okay, that's interesting, because I know that some Companies, they use specific code to warm up the JVM to make sure it's in a warmed up state when they run it in production. And if you have this code, then you can do something like run the code. Once this is finished, you can create the checkpoint. And then that's all you need to do. Otherwise, you have to run it manually. And then you have to create the checkpoint by using J command. Both is possible. But uh, in bigger applications, the, the programmatic approach is probably easier to do. Okay, that leads me to a very simple example, but it explains the, the whole thing quite easily. I've wrote a little application. There is a scheduled thread. Every five seconds, it will call a method, and in this uh, loop, and in this loop, it's from one to one hundred thousand. I take a random number in the range of one to one hundred thousand, and then I call a method that checks this number for prime. Pretty easy. So the first thing the method does is checking is the result already in the cache. If it's in the cache, it returns the result that's pretty fast. If it's not in the cache, it checks if this given number is a prime number, then it has a result, and then it takes the result, stores it in the cache, and returns it then. So it takes longer, of course. <clears throat> and to make it a little more realistic, the cache forgets after 60 seconds if a, a value that is stored in the cache is older than 60 seconds, it just wipes it out. That's the main idea. Okay, keep that in mind with the 60-second wipeout. 
First run, it will be pretty slow. The cache is empty, that means every number has to be checked and stored into the cache and then it returns the result. The longer we run it, the more often we call it, the cache will be fill up slowly. That means the results will come in much faster. Uh, this is the main idea, So, th which is in principle the same as a JVM warming up because you have caches and maps that will be filled. And so it just takes some time to get everything set up. And I made some tests and that was it, the result of it. So if I just use the application performance and have the iterations uh, on the x-axis, then you see it took some time. In this case, it was nine to 10 calls iterations to make it as fast as possible and after that it was more or less stable. Okay, so the demo, I do it in two parts. And the first thing is I just show you everything I will later do on in the, in the shells, show you here because I need to explain some stuff. <clears throat> so on the left side, I start the crack for jar with this parameter where I save the files in some folder. It's crack files in this case. Okay, then I start it up, the first run this is on this machine running Linux and Parallels for, Win for Mac, so it takes some time. The same on my M1 Mac takes around a second, the first run. Here it's great because it takes around 30 seconds for the first run. And then you see 63% roughly the cache is filled after the first run. Okay, second run, it's around 10 seconds, and then it gets faster and faster because the cache is filled now, right? Okay, that's fine. And at some point, here now, oh no, the next one, now it's fast enough. Now in the second shell, I just create the checkpoint by calling this one with just j command crack for jar jdk.checkpoint. This will take care about creating the checkpoint and then on the other one you will see something like that. I just put in some system out print lines to, to show you the, the order that the methods will be called. I just created two resources. The cache don't really need a resource. I just did that to show you the order of the, the calling. So it will first call before checkpoint in main. After that, it will call the checkpoint in, generate, in generic cache. And then you will see something like checkpoint and killed because the JVM will be killed. After that, it's, it's gone and the files are stored. And this whole period is usually the application startup time, right? Because that's how long it took to really run the application fast. So now I say, okay, restore this stuff, okay? And remember what I told you about the 60 second cache wipe out. What would you assume that if I started five minutes later, what should happen then? First time I call it, the first number it will check, it will check the cache and it will figure out, oh, all the numbers are too old and wipe out the cache, right? Well, it doesn't because I took care about that. And this is exactly the point. If you have data that is time dependent, you have to take care about that. So what I did here, because it's, it's very useful that the checkpoint stores everything, at the moment I store the cache, I just store the current epoch milliseconds in a variable. When I restore it, I just compare that stored value to the current one and apply the delta to all values in the cache. And that's it. And then everything's up to date again. But you have to take care about that on your own. So that means if you have time dependent data and you create a checkpoint and you might see something's wrong after you restore, then this is typically something you have to take a look at. It's the, the timing stuff. Date and, date and time stuff is critical. And you have to take care. You just have to think about everything, the complete state, you just drop it into a file. Once you restore it and you depend on time, you have to make sure that the JVM knows that there was some time in between stopping and starting it, right? So that's something you have to keep in mind here. But if you do it, you see it's directly fast from the start. So that means the 11th run was 17 milliseconds and then the 12th run, it just continues counting it's 23 milliseconds, so it could be 18, 20, this depends. But this is, uh, as you can see, it's really fast, and then it stays fast. And you can imagine that when I stop it, I can restore again, and it will be again fast. Means if you take something like that, a JVM with your application, you put in a Docker container, you warm up the Docker container and your application, you create this checkpoint, 
And the next time you deploy the Docker container, you let it start from the checkpoint, right? Then it's just fast because the only thing that you have, the only limitation is loading the stuff from the hard drive into memory. That's the only limitation that we have, <coughs> right? Okay, so that you see, this is the demo. We will take a look at that later on. And as I said already, you can create the checkpoint using J command, or you can use the code. The demo, if you're interested in, it's not a secret, it's, it's not very fancy, but it works, is on my Twitter account, you can find it there. And the JDK version that I used for it is the one that's also on GitHub. So you can just download and try yourself, it's really interesting. I, one thing you need to know, you need a Linux machine, it needs to be Intel architecture. Because we only have the JDK for Intel architecture at the moment. So there isn't really a reason not to run it on ARM, but we don't have an open JDK built on ARM for that. Because it's an ongoing project, <coughs> this is the only thing we have right now, which is the reason why I have to run it on this virtual machine here on my Mac. Okay. So that's cool. I showed you a nice demo. It's fast. Okay. You believe me, of course. Um, so how good is it really? Because the real stuff that we are interested in is these things, right? So what about Spring Boot? What about Micronaut, Quarkus? And there's also some XML transform that we did. These are the startup times. Spring Boot, around four seconds. Micronaut, one second. Quarkus, around one second. It's pretty fast. If we use crack on that, this have been the starting times. And I think this is much faster, right? So, and you, the, the interesting thing here is, I told you, the only limitation is loading, more or less. That's the reason why it doesn't matter how slow it started in the beginning. Once you load it from the hard drive, the speed is more or less the same, the startup speed, because it's just loading stuff into memory. Plus, if you have to re-establish resources like database connections and sockets, you have to add that, of course, right? But anyway, this is much faster than before. And these demos are also available. So you, if you don't believe us, you can just try it. The code is there. You can just try it on your own. And it's really fascinating to play around with it because it's so fast. <coughs> Here are some other numbers, like uh, we just tried it with a normal OpenJDK or OpenJDK on crack. This is Spring Boot, requests, number of requests, and then just the, the, the seconds it took. And you see that the crack stuff is more or less linear because, of course, it's just a warmed up JVM. So there are no peaks anymore where the unwarmed up, the cold JVM, is really take some time in the beginning, right? And we also did that for Quarkus, and that's how it looks like there. Okay, so this is what it is in principle. It's not very fancy. It's not very <coughs> technical or hard to implement. You need to do something to do that. So it doesn't come for free, which is a drawback, I agree. And in principle, what it is, it's a way to pause a JVM-based application and restore it at some point in the future. It doesn't matter when, right? As long as you take care about time-based stuff. The benefit is potentially extremely fast startup time to full performance. It's in principle the same speed that you get with a native image. Plus, you have still the JIT optimizations, right? So it's, it's just a running Java application on the JVM so there's no problem with dependencies or reflection or something like that. It's like you just run the JVM normally. <coughs> it eliminates need for hotspot identification, method compiles, and so on, that we see in the beginning at the startup. You just have to do it once, and after that, it, it's, it's okay, right? You don't need all the CPU power, too. And uh, that means we have improved throughput from the start, and it's an open JDK project, as I said which is also a little bit of a problem because you can imagine um, at the moment on Linux, it just works on Linux using Creo, but there's nothing like Creo on Windows or Mac. And that means if you have a Java application and it's, it would be part of the official OpenJDK distribution, then it would mean either we need something on Windows and Mac, while Windows has something like Hibernate, which uses the same technology, right? So the, the computer just goes into the sleep mode saves every, everything to disk. Once you open the lid on your notebook, it's just there. It's the same technology, but this is not available. On Mac, it's the same. Creo is part of the Linux kernel. <clears throat> That's the reason why we can use it there. Um, that means if Oracle decides, oh, you know what, it's not really cross-platform available, they might to drop it. 
That's the risk. On the other hand, if they will do that, we probably will build it into our own JVM, right, as a feature. Might be possible. And it can also save infrastructure costs. Because I told you, this is usually the CPU utilization. If you start up a JVM, and then I told you in the beginning, we have this is the JVM warm-up time, and this is more or less the overhead from interpretation and compilation. Because afterwards, it runs more or less at the same CPU level. And if you create a checkpoint at this position, then you can imagine, once you start it up from there, you don't need that high power node on the cluster again, right? So because now you can use a node that maybe has just, I don't know, let's say eight instead of 12 cores or something like that. So it can save money, definitely. And then you also get rid of this warm-up time and the CPU overhead that we saw in the beginning of the, of the chart. The whole thing is available under github.com slash crack, <coughs> if you would take a look at that. And there's also a wiki page for that. So yeah, people who take pictures, everybody ready. Um, there's also wiki open jdk.org slash display slash crack, where you can find that too. All right. So now, time for the real demo. This is all great. But it's better if you see it, because this is just cool stuff. Uh, what's the time? Oh, yeah, good in time. So what I did, this is the, the Linux. Oh, we don't see the screen. What is that? Why do we? Ah. OK, it handles the as a second screen. I don't know why. We have, this is the Linux virtual machine. We have two shells open, and on the left side, I just created a script to get rid of all this Java, double X, and so on. So I just started, and we will see it will take 22 second, 27 seconds for the first run. It's in principle the same stuff that I put in the slides, but nevertheless, it's really interesting to see once it warms up and we do the restore, how fast it can get. And the interesting part, I, I did that same demo at the Amsterdam Jug. <laughs> and at that point, the Linux version decided to do an update in the background, which was great because the time getting slower and slower instead of faster. So, and I was like, oh, this is bad. <laughs> so we have been in the end about, I don't know, 55 seconds. So I was like, hmm. And then I figured out that it does the update. So I stopped it and again, and then it, it worked. But it's, yeah, demo gods. As you can see now, it's, it's getting faster and faster. We wait until, because at the 12th run, there's something going on. It will get slower again. 60 or 40, something like that. I think 60, maybe, ah. And then it will get faster again. And around 15, it levels up to 40 milliseconds, right? This is the, the stuff that I figured out. And then it stays like that. It, this it depends on your machine and everything. So on this one, it's like that. So now we stop it. OK, I just executed the command there. You see the pit on top, 12 for 11. And also on the left side, you see this is the pit, right? <coughs> so it stores the file. And there's one problem still in the current code, because it always says command executed successfully, even if it didn't. So uh, we will fix that. But at the moment, just don't worry. If there are no files in, the, in your folder, then probably something went wrong. So this is uh, yeah, it's a little bit misleading. OK, so we wait a little bit, and then I go back here. And I call the restore. OK, 15th run, 41 milliseconds. Now I press start. And oh, here we go. It's still at 61. This always depends a little bit, but every five seconds, and it's still fast. And this is exactly the effect, and it doesn't matter what you do. You can run a Spring application, if you like, a Spring Boot application. <coughs> And it will be the same startup time. It just depends on how many resources you have to reestablish. That might bring it a little bit down, but it will still be under a second easily. I think under 100 milliseconds it should be easily under that. So, and now the interesting part is now I stopped it, I just can res restart again, right? And you will see, we, wish we should see the same more or less. You see, now it's 56. It's, it always depends a little bit, but. Um, you see that it's 
more or less the same as before. And now you can imagine if you put that in a container and just start it, you can start it up easily, it's fast, and uh, you don't have to worry about uh, JVM startup times anymore. So, and the files that are saved here, we can take a look at that. Crack files, I think, yes. These are the files, and you see the biggest file is around 32 megabytes, something like that. This is a small app. This is also something you have to keep in mind. If you use a large heap, then the whole heap has to be saved, right? So that means the larger the heap, the bigger the files in the end. It's not that big of a problem, but because loading from an SSD into memory is really fast, but that could bring you down to, to other numbers, right? It, it doesn't have to be this. I run it on my, on my other Mac. I also have an older one, and that, that is running natively Linux. And this is twice as fast as this one. So it really depends on the machine <coughs> you run it on and also on the, on the hardware that you use. All right, so with this, let me go back. What happens now? Oh, I switch it back to that. With this, I'm done. So, and we have still eight minutes and 40 seconds left for questions, if there are questions. No questions? Okay. We can do it here. If you don't, haven't put something in the app, you can also, I think, is the microphone on? You can go to the mic and just ask the question. Otherwise, you can also ask it like that. We can hear that, so, yeah. I, I have a quick question. So yeah, sure. Thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. So I'm wondering, as you mentioned Spring a couple of times, so typically, like, files and network connections and so yeah. you don't open them directly in your code. It's uh, more hidden in the underlying framework. So is there any framework? I should have said Spring Boot, not Spring. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because you are right. That's exactly true. Spring has also... This is one of the problems, right? If you have an application that relies on frameworks, I told you, okay, you just have to implement the resource interface, but you can't do that in the framework, right? So that means if you have a framework that uses excessively loading files somewhere and storing files and have connections open and stuff like that, then it's tricky. Then I, it probably won't work. Uh, that depends. The, and Spring is some of these candidates, right? They do that a lot. So in Spring Boot, it's, it's better. So we like, we, like I said, we did that test on Spring Boot and it worked. But that doesn't mean it will always work, right? You have to try it. I can't really guarantee that it will work with your application. But I talked to people that tried it and they really liked it a lot because it, it brought down the, the startup times a lot. But yes, if, if, you depend, if your code depends on libraries or frameworks that on its own open resources, then it probably won't work. Yeah. Another question. Sure. Just to, so in Micron, we are considering support for crack and we are going to add support so that you can define like order resources. Mm -hmm. So we will provide you like an API to do that on the framework level. Oh, nice. Look, yeah, it's, thank you. <laughs> that you have is my code one. So we expect like the results in crack like to be comparable with you. Oh, cool. Okay, it's great, it's technology. Uh, I'm wondering which version of Java is going to be available? Uh, the available version at the moment is 17.02. That's the one that we have. And I mean, it's in principle possible because it's open source, right? If you build your own JDK, feel free to build it. It's, you can do that, so, but uh, not everybody can build your own JDK. Custom build? It's, it's already built, you can just take it and install it. Oh, yeah. But if you would like to build it, then you can also use the latest sources and build your own, yeah. Okay. I'll just, there's a <laughs> Yeah, one more question. Sure. Uh, I want to continue, uh, guys said about Micronaut, uh, what about other frameworks, uh, maybe application servers, container servlets, all the things? Well, Can you yes. share your um, plans? Yes, um, it's a good question. So we, we need to, to create demos for that, right? There is also one I, I forgot to mention. We also have a Lambda demo in the meantime with AWS Lambdas <coughs> because they really benefit from that and the Corredo guys really like that a lot. Um, it just takes time, right? This is the problem. You have to create a demo, set it up, make all the stuff available, and this is the main problem at the moment, because we don't have, it's not that this is the main project we are working on. It's something that is great, that we found it's worth putting it into OpenJDK, but we also see the risk that if Oracle drops it, then you have to really make sure that it's worth spending a lot of time. That's the reason why we're here, right, <laughs> to talk about it, to get you infected with crack, um, and make you really rely on it. 
<laughs> no, it's, it's good stuff. You just play around with it. I, I, you can create the demo on your own if you like, because all the stuff is there. You just can install it and try to run it. And if you face problems, you can even file issues in GitHub. It's because everything's available, so it's not really hidden or something. Yeah, but, but we, we don't have um, more demos at the moment. Yeah, maybe I should ask people to create more demos. <laughs> yeah, that was another question. I saw you were using a virtual machine in a Mac. What about containers? Will it work? It will work, yes. The, yeah. the AWS demo, it is, in a, is running in a Docker container. So, but nice. I didn't create a container for that because I just would like to show the idea and keep it as simple as possible. It's a demo. <laughs> Cool, thanks. So that's also the reason why I don't really use Spring Boot demos or something, which is great. But if you see the shell, like pfft, all this stuff that's showing, and no, it's, I thought it must be easy to understand. <laughs> oh, that's another one. Yeah, we still have four minutes, so it's all good. Too. <laughs> okay, so what did you say? Um, as far as I know, in Quarkus, I think they contributed some code to, yes. to use this, and uh, but there was an actual question. <laughs> um, so. Uh, so when you use GraalVM to take a snapshot and native image, what they do to reduce the memory footprint on disk is to navigate the heap mm -hmm. to reduce the object graph. So yeah. are you thinking about, is it, is it possible at all to, uh, to do this uh, at some point? Do you think it would be feasible for Crack to take a dump of the memory but just some regions instead of the entire Yeah, that's of the a heap? good question. I think how it is implemented right now or not. So it will, we will compact the heap and make sure it's, it's ah. as small as possible, but it's not really that we just compact or, or take sp specific parts of the heap. So it's, mm -hmm. it's the whole heap, yeah. But okay. it's compacted at least, yeah. Okay, thank you. M but maybe there, yeah, yeah. there are a lot of ideas. Idea. So yeah. it's, uh, people come up with how can you do maybe something like do incremental steps, right? right. So the, uh, something like that. Yeah, there are a lot of ideas what you can improve on that, but yeah. Right. Like I said, resources. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We still um, have three hi. minutes. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just thinking how, how I can actually use it in my pipeline. And a question uh, for me is, what happens if you, for example, create a, a checkpoint? Let's say I have a suite of integration tests in my CI. Mm -hmm. Then I know that that's executed the real server and it's formed up. Mm -hmm. But also have JUnit, other test independencies. If that is safe, that that checkpoint from my testing mm -hmm. packages. Will that work when I only bundle the, the jar? Like um, yes, if you have the, the right JDK for the testing, then it would work, sure. This is really just stopping the JVM and restoring it. If you use the same JDK with the abilities, there's one thing you have to keep in mind. If your application is relying on environment variables and stuff like that, of course you have to establish them also on the other machine, right? So you can't assume that it, it will know the stuff that is available on that machine. But if you set up the test environment in the same way as the production stuff, for example, you have all the environment variables, you have the same JDK that is able to run crack, then it's, this is possible, yes. But, so I will need my so my environment variables will need to be the same or just to be kind of uh, defined also? Oh, what do you mean exactly? I didn't really get that. that no, part. like, let's just imagine, the most easy that the DB password from the integration test is mm -hmm. one, two, three, and for uh, production is a long hash, whatever. Mm -hmm. or, that, or maybe that will be part of the restore, like after restore, yeah, I you could can just do that. overlap yes, with yes, the environment. Yeah, you can. This is, yeah, it's, you can do, this is, people think too complex about that whole thing, right? So in principle, it's really, you stop that thing and you restore it. That's what you do. Once you did that and you restore it, the JVM doesn't know anything about it. For them, it's like you put it, put it in a black hole and then just get it out and start it again. And the JVM thinks, oh, oh, it's all good. I'm still running. So it doesn't know that it was stopped, really, the JVM itself. Mm -hmm. Except your methods that get called. That's the only thing. Whatever you do, you can use environment variables. You can, when you create the checkpoint, you can store them. When you restore, you can set them again. All these things are possible. It's, this is, there's no, no stuff that, that keeps you away from that. Cool. It should be possible. And if I programmatically uh, create the checkpoint, mm -hmm. I guess that is actually uh, stopping that application. Yes. So that instance on the say, Kubernetes will die. Yes. Uh, in the sake of creating yes, the... Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That, that's exactly the case. It doesn't matter from where you create the checkpoint, checkpointing really stops the JVM. And then you have to restart it from that files. Yeah, so there's maybe one more question, 10 seconds. If you are fast, then. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, Hi. oh, sorry, sorry. There was one, one before. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for the great talk. It was really insightful. So we're doing a lot of um, performance stuff on Lambda. Mm -hmm. And you already mentioned that the example was on a container runtime. And yeah. in, I mean, in addition, in the serverless environment, in addition to the startup time, package size is also like um, important, right? So for example, on Lambda, we have the limit of 250 megabytes for mm -hmm. a zipped, um, unzipped uh, package. So do you have some kind of numbers on, on a Spring Boot? So how big like the files could get? And is there any kind of no, really ideas about what we could do about like compress that? Because it's very essential because every for every cold start, you would yeah, have to true. download the full package. Yeah, yeah. Not sure, to be honest. So I don't have numbers about the package sizes, <coughs> but um, I just know that we, that the, like I said, the, the people from Amazon, we are in touch with them and they really like that idea and probably the, it will show up in, in Corredo at some point, t for the lenders especially. Um, but I have no idea about the package sizes if, if there is something going on in this direction, maybe. But you can, you, like I said, put, that, put an issue in the GitHub repo and just ask. Because the engineers that are working on Crack in our company, they, they will take care about that and, and they m might have numbers, right? So I, I don't have numbers, but this is all I have, but that might be possible, yeah. But then it's not lost if you put it there. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think uh, we are done. But if you have a question, you can come to me. I will answer it to you later. So thanks for attending. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>